2.37. Uh, this is Five Live. Delighted to say that Ben Wheatley is with us, director, co-editor and co-writer of Free Fire. Hello, Ben. How are you? I'm very good, thank did, you. I get all those cre- did, is that right? All the, the, the credits yes. in the right? Yes. There's a lot of uh, yeah, co's and kind of Venn, the Venn diagram of creation on this film is complicated. Uh, you can actually now watch on the live stream, by the way. Normally, there's no point in watching the live stream because, it's just, well, it's always pretty good and Mark always looks impeccable. Thank you. And I dress like a teenager. Yes. However, now we've actually got Ben Wheatley in the studio so we can actually look at him and he's actually waving to you as part of the personal so, <laughs> uh, via the Five Live website. So, uh, Free Fire, what an extraordinary and astonishing and wonderful film. Tell us, uh, just in- introduce us to this new world and your new movie, Ben. Um, yeah, basically, it's a movie um, that's about a gun deal, and there's two sets of people that um, come to this warehouse, kind of come broken down factory in somewhere in America, Massachusetts, maybe somewhere that's well, it's unsp- Boston. Well, it doesn't say so in the movie. Oh, okay. But this is to protect me from the the, the rabid um, Boston. Um, uh, Gangs? Accent, ac- okay. accent police. Okay, so it's Boston, but not Boston. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Massachusetts, maybe in, okay. a, in near a town where these accents make sense. Okay, um, and uh, <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> and uh, in the seventies, so there's yeah. lo- there's loads of caveats there for when I do the Q and A's in Boston. Um, and uh, and basically, yeah, this, there's this gun deal, and the uh, uh, and it all falls to pieces because of minor m- the the guys who have been hired to to carry the boxes around are um, uh, have been in a bar fight the night before. So then all sorts of hijinks ensue. But it's basically a kind of, it would have been a very big, complicated movie, crime movie about Boston with like car chases and fights in bars and all kinds of stuff. But it got, just gets broken in the first scene and it never escapes that scene as they as they fight it out. So the, so the all that bit, which you just said, that, that's the first half hour? Yeah, the setup. Yeah. Okay. And then the rest of it is the shootout. Yeah, is the, is the, is, they all, there's, there's a, Without spoiling the whole movie, yes. but there's a, there's kind of a, the action starts and then it's basically as each character um, uh, becomes wounded, they realise that there's the, 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 their options become smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's how do they? It becomes a game of cat and mouse as so they they swap allegiances and try and survive in this environment. Yeah, in fact, I, I'm, I can't remember which character says it, but halfway through the movie, one of them says... I've forgotten which side I'm on. Well, first of all, someone says, I've forgotten what, what side I'm on. And someone says, who's shooting at us now? Yeah, yeah. Because it's quite difficult. Because the shooting is happening all around this warehouse. You're thinking, well, this is... Uh, it, but you, but it's very entertaining. It's very funny uh, as well. But it, before we get on to the, the humour, can you just explain about what you were trying to do in giving it giving us a full hour of a shootout the what you so it's it is an action movie but it's it's slightly different just tell us what you were aiming for well i i i'd, I'd been uh, my son's 13 so i'd managed to see or every tentpole movie of the last two or three years and um i was feeling a bit jaded by stuff by and, and things that i should have been amazed by you know like planets blowing up and giant robots punching dinosaurs and all this kind of stuff <laughs> and i was feeling a bit blue about it and i was looking like, oh i don't why am i not enjoying this and then i kind of look back at the the movies i really like from the 70s and 80s and and realized that it was things of things used to be on a bit more of a human scale you know they used to be a bit smaller and a bit more intimate and i thought well what, you know what if you go back to that um, uh, maybe the audience will engage more with it, and so I kind of thought I'll make I'll make a I'll take an action movie and then I'll break it down into its component parts and make it much much smaller, but with the same kind of actions, but then reduced down. So it's more more on a personal level. People might be wondering how can a shootout last so long, but you looked quite long and hard about what a shootout is actually like and when there are lots of bullets flying and it isn't i mean there i think it's fair to say without giving to there isn't a clean kill in any in any of uh, no, no, no that doesn't happen at any stage yeah but, but I'm, I'm starting to feel like kind of on the side of the stormtroopers in star wars you know the much maligned stormtroopers who apparently could can't never hit anything. Can't hit anything but apparently that's that's more more than likely it's like you know People are really good on rifle ranges and stuff and can hit targets all day long. But when the targets start firing back at them, that, that's when nerves set in and it's very difficult. And if, if things are moving and running and everyone's moving about, which they are in the film, it, it then becomes um, um, pretty tricky. But you also described reading, um, I think it was an FBI report of a shootout in Miami in yeah. which something like 200 rounds fired and nobody hit anything at all. <laughs> well, yeah, they did. They, they did in the end. But it was kind of, yeah, it was, it was quite, you know, I'd read this report and it was... Um, very procedural. It was like reading a kind of a cross between a, a short story and, a, and an epic poem kind of thing of, of, of misery and death. And, and 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 I was just amazed by how, um, you know, how with trained people, how many times they fired guns, how many times they missed and how long they went on without being without 
um, succumbing to their wounds. Um, you know, tragically, a load of people did die in the end of it, but it was like it went on for about 40 minutes. Um, and I thought that, and this is no great epiphany, obviously, but I, I thought, well, that's not like Hollywood. You know, Hollywood movies is... Um, everything's very clean and, um, and and a gun is like a death ray that whenever it goes anywhere near baddies, they all just fall on the ground dead. So, Well, the other expression you used was that you said it was you wanted to make a movie that was that had a relatable thing in it, like banging your finger in a car door or getting hit by a rock or something, which is something that the audience could, could actually relate to as opposed to entire cities and worlds yeah. blowing up and vaporising. And that's what I found with the, when, with the screenings that I've been at were... The most reactions uh, come from things that can happen in every day, like pricking a finger on a, on a needle or something like that, or um, being ha- being hit with a rock. The uh, the audience are much more, oh my god, rather than people being shot, which they're going out there. We know we've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, it's time for a clip. So this will give you a little bit of the flavour of the film. This is Killian Murphy's character Chris testing the merchandise of. See, I'm laughing already because <laughs> uh, he's testing the merchandise uh, which comes from Vern, which is the character played by Charlotte Copley. I think we. Got off on a little bit of a bad foot in there, eh? I think what we need to do is just start afresh. So I'm going to be the gentleman in this relationship and I'm going to chuck in a free box of lube because she likes to run wet. Whoa, whoa. Slow the roll for a minute. Public safety announcement while the rifle's hot. I'm going to pull my pistol out. Nothing personal. Knock yourself out, Spark. Okay, just try not to hit any of the metal work because I... I don't want to get any of those bling burns on my new suit. Suit. Sorry, what was that? This is from several... Well, that's a fairly accurate sort of balance, I think. There, you were and you were laughing, but what are you laughing at? This is your film. Well, I think it's <laughs> because it's quite intense in the headphones like this. So, yeah, the... the, the the intention on, of it what, with the sound design was to make the gunshot sound r- as real as possible and to put the audience right in the middle of the action. Um, and uh, there's been a, a you know, I, I feel sad when I watch TV because the bandwidth of it's so narrow. So they mix like gunshots as loud as punches and people are often firing guns and talking over the top of it. And the sound of a, of a, of a gun going off is not only incredibly loud, but it's actually physically painful, you know, and... Um, and we tried to obviously didn't want to hurt the audience, but we wanted to bring that kind of more intense feeling of of what um, uh, guns and bullets whizzing around actually feels like. But there's a lot of bullets. Yeah, I mean, um, but basically all the actors um, uh, were very careful to count how many bullets that they fired across the movie, and that they would have that they would have them on them, so that it wasn't like an infinite amount of um, bullets like you might get in a John Woo movie or something like that. Except for Sam Riley. And he fired far too much, and he would have had to, have, you know, he should have turned up with a rucksack on, with all the clips. That's interesting. So, so you each each act had a discipline then in terms of how much firing they could actually get away with. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. We did think about that because, it, and, and you do see them reloading, and there's other things like the guns jamming, which they di- they actually physically jammed in this space anyway because of all the dust, yeah. and they would have done. And so we that was all incorporated into the movie as well. The other thing I think is really important about, I mean, I think people read films differently, um, but the way that I read it was that one of the things that was happening in that soundtrack was that it it puts me in mind of the sound effects from Looney Tunes cartoons because. Mm. It is an awful lot. I mean, it's a very funny film. The, the, there's a lot of really, really sort of sharp dialogue in it. But actually, the way that the sound effects work are that kind of kinetic, uh, you know, that kinetic comedy that al- that combines, on the one hand, almost silent movie slapstick, that sort of absurdist silent movie slapstick, and then this cacophony of sound, which 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 did seem to me to be to be influenced by animation i know you've spoken in an interview recently about tom and jerry but there is something about that kind of kinetic sound comedy and obviously from your own background you come from doing virals and doing sort of comedy shows you do understand how a joke works how the sound of a joke works so all the time that you're getting yourself yes it's you know frightening and yes it's intense but it's also intensely funny because it's so absurd the strange dings and bangs and ricochets and furniture falling downstairs and bits of masonry so I mean, it's that's part of the joy of the film 
Yeah, I mean, I you know, I did. There was a bit of self um, control. I had a, I had the art con, art department build a shelf, which had uh, um, like a, a an award on it and a bowling ball and something else. And it was meant the shelf was meant to go like that, and then each of these things drop onto Shelter Copley's head. And I and yeah, and I held back on that because I knew it was just too. It was just a little bit too far. But... Interesting to know that you were tempted by that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that towards the end of the movie um, it is kind of about you know, how far that we can punish Shalto. I've got two names circled here uh, on my notes, which I was scribbling down as I was watching the film. Uh, one is Martin Scorsese, which we'll come to. But first, John Denver, a, a name I haven't written down at any stage whilst we've been doing this programme. And he works at Radio 2, so, you know... <laughs> well, John Denver does feature at Radio 2, but he doesn't feature much in mm. soundtracks, it has to be said. Mm. So explain how you've used uh, John Denver, which well, is still making me smile. Well, John Denver... Um, uh, was in the script from the beginning when when the first draft was written that that John Den, the the Annie song was always going to be in the movie. So, um, and I've got a kind of personal policy with with soundtracks is that I kind of if I put something in a movie, it's usually something I do listen to regularly. It's not uh, you know I don't, I'm not in for stunt kind of uh, sarcastic use of music. It's like I like I like the Annie song track a lot. Um, but when I was imagining the movie. Um, um, originally, and I, I kind of movies usually come through as for me as like um, uh, images first, like the first couple of kind of thoughts about it. And it was like a truck that was driving in a circle in an empty warehouse with a guy who was bleeding to death, and um, uh, and what would be the uh, um, worst music to come on the radio at that point. And I thought it would be Annie's song. And he's like there going, oh, I'm not sure. He's like not decided about John Denver, where he likes him or not. But he's only got so much energy left before he dies. Does he steer the truck over to the side with that last bit of energy or does he turn off Annie's song? You know, and that's the dilemma. Um, so that was it, really, you know. And I, I and I think it's it's just a really, it's a beautiful song, but it's a sad song as well. And you can it almost feels like in the film it's just sucking the life out of the... I mean, it will, it will be the case, I mean, Mark mentioned this, you know, before we went to the news, that you know, in the same way that when you hear Stuck in the Middle with You by Steelers Will, you don't necessarily think of it in the same way once you've seen it in the Tarantino film. But now when Annie's song comes on, I will have an image. Yeah, you have for... spoiled it for a generation. In a good way, but that is that is what people will I, hear. I, I'd like to think I've introduced John Denver to a generation rather than yeah. ru ruined it. No, no, I mean, no, <laughs> Spoiled is, is perhaps is perhaps the wrong word. Maybe re revivified would be would be the word. I've got, there's lots of listeners' questions. Before we get there, can you just so Martin Scorsese is there as executive producer? Yeah. Um, ex ex explain how you got him involved with the project. Well, um, I'd kind of I'd read an article that um that he'd been interviewed in the Telegraph, and uh, while he was doing Hugo, and they said um. What are, you, what are you up to in the evenings, Martin? And he said, oh, well, I've been watching British films. And so he'd been watching, like, um, Joanna Hogg's um, Archipelago and he'd been watching the... And Andrew, you're a big Joanna Hogg fan. I'm a big Joanna Hogg fan, yeah. And he'd, he'd seen Red Road and stuff like that. And um, the, and he said he'd seen Kill List. And so I was like, ooh, that's interesting. Uh, and I talked to my American agent who, who's the, in the same agency as Scorsese is and said, look, if you can do anything for me, you know, I'm a... As much as I'd love to do some massive big franchise movie, but if you can get me to, if I can meet Scorsese, that would be it. You know, that'd be the best thing that could ever happen. Um, being a big, you know, you know, I wouldn't have made, started making movies if it wasn't Scors for Scorsese. I remember seeing Taxi Driver when I was like 15, and that was the moment when I kind of went, oh God, this, the films are made by people rather than just stuff from telly, you know. And, uh, and yeah, and I got to meet him. I went to, when I was in New York doing the press for Sightseers. Um, I went to his house and chatted to him, and we kind of got on all right. And and uh, they and then I got a call uh, a, a while later from uh, his production company, Cicalia, and they said, "Well, if you're ever developing something, why don't you send it in?" So I was like, "Right, <laughs> 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 I will do that definitely." And it kind of started from there, really. So does he? How does the executive producer then, being Martin, how does he get involved? What does he do? Does he is he there when you're when you're filming? Does he look at the edit? What does, how does it would have been amazing if he'd been there because we shot it in Brighton. Brighton. Yeah, <laughs> he can go the, to Brighton. Well, yeah, get the train down. Oh, it's delayed. I can't believe it. <laughs> Poor, poor old Scorsese. Yeah, although if Scorsese had come out about Southern Rail, I think it would have got sorted out, but, you know. <laughs> so, I've got yeah. to go via Angmering. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. So, no, he do, he, he what he does is, uh, A, it, you know, it, it gives the a, a film a, a, a legitimacy when you're casting it and trying to raise the money for it. Um, and then it... Uh, uh, he looked at the script um, and then he looked at edits as well. So um, and 
Andy Stark, the producer, and I went to New York to talk to him. So he'd seen the film, but without any music in it. Um, and we had a very nervous few days in New York waiting to go to, to have an audience with him and kind of get the good or bad news, you know. And it was almost, I just don't know what we'd have done if he didn't like it, because it's just the end, isn't it? There's no arguing your way out of it or discussing it, going, you know. And him. What just do going, you know? Yeah, exactly, him just going, oh, it's no taxi driver, is it? <laughs> you know, like, oh, all right, sorry, Martin, you know. <laughs> Can I very quickly ask you, and I, I've, I've asked you this before, but I do think it's fascinating. You work all the time with uh, Amy Jump, and she writes and she edits, and you are constantly out there with the movies, doing Q&As, uh, on Twitter, reading... Who's your stuff. partner, you should say, in life? Yeah. Yes, but all, but I actually, in this particular case, uh, the c- c- yeah. filmmaking partner, but yes, yeah. also enough. Um, and Amy Jump does no, doesn't do the press, doesn't do any of that stuff, because her belief is that the work should speak for itself. And between you, therefore, you seem to have like a perfect thing, which is somebody who's very front-facing and somebody who's just not having anything to do with that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, and I totally respect her stance. I wish I could, I wish I thought of it. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I think it's, you know, she's, her, her energy's, you know, focused on the on the filmmaking. And I think, you know, you know, her kind of motto is almost, is always like too much chat. There's too much chat. Don't talk about it so much. No, everyone should just stop talking, you know, and just get on with the, on with the making. But I sent her the link to your, your podcast, the video thing the other day. Yeah. He did. And I just got a text back, just said, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some listeners' questions. Let's see how many we can uh, we can get in here. Matt Aston in Winchmore Hill. Ben directed me some years ago in an Easter Tesco advert. <laughs> no. oh, it's an un- unlikely story. Oh, I did, yes, yeah. Although, <laughs> yeah. although not an actor, I'm actually a theatre director, but I didn't let on. I think I got the job because he liked my beard. We had to pretend to eat and enjoy an Easter Sunday roast whilst the daughter of the family looked for a chocolate rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> ben brought out what can only be described an enthusiastic performance out of me, although the vast majority of it was understandably lost in the edit. It was a lovely day. Ben was fantastic, and the catering was excellent. Anyway. Um, so what's the question? That <laughs> was just a, a nice email. <laughs> That's uh, good. Yeah, yeah. Callum Sires, you often cast Michael Smiley in your films. Many directors have the regular performers who will often, uh, they'll often turn to time and time again because something about their performing style gels with their directing style. Is there something specific about Smiley's performance that makes you want to go with him so regularly uh yeah i think it's because he can uh he can go from being very very uh friendly to very very scary very very quickly and um a lot of the films we've made have been um about that kind of movement of emotion from comedy to um seriousness and backwards and forwards so he he kind of represents that also he's like um you know he's a he represents to me like a grown up and an adult, but also um, he can play the kind of um, uh, slightly man child thing uh, qualities that that kind of seem to populate my all my films. Christopher Hamilton on an email. I was at the QFT preview showing of Free Fire in Belfast, and I loved it, by the way. And although I met the man afterwards, and he generously posed for a picture with me, I never got to ask the question that I wanted to at the Q and A after it. So this oh, is this it's is a it. long journey. To the, the question picture. is: yeah. I, has, I have been following your career and knew you were making Free Fire at the time it was shooting, and a poster was released for it beforehand. But it had original cast members Luke Evans and Olivia Wilde on the poster. Now I know actors can drop out of films at the last minute, but it's very strange to see a poster released with the actor's name on it that never appeared in the actual film so was it says christopher was it a very last minute thing that uh, and how did the poster get released the poster was made for uh sometimes when you're making a movie you have a sales poster where you go and you put the poster together and then you go and pitch the movie to get the mm-hmm. finance so that was one of those really and it probably should never have got out or we should have got rid of the names off of it when um uh, when the film became more official but yeah luke luke uh went on to he, he made, had to make a decision to make a different movie and he went on to some art film about talking candlesticks um yeah. and did that instead what, and what i don't happened, understand what happened yeah. to that i don't just understand why he did sank that. he just you know it's, it's a, a weird idea where people 39 million pounds of <laughs> is that it? yeah that's the current, really? the current i don't understand it they, they sing the words Instead of talking a bit, it's just bizarre <laughs> to me. And Olivia Wilde, you know, he's talking about Scorsese. Scorsese gives and Scorsese takes away. So he took her off to do vinyl. So that and there was a clash. So she couldn't meet the dates, um, and and so she couldn't do it. And she was gutted, and so so was I at that at that point. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's nothing nothing sinister. It wasn't no. falling out with me. Was... Joe Hollingworth asks: With the rise of the R-rated superhero film, would you consider making one if offered, and which one would you like to adapt? If so. Um, Slash, what are you doing next? Um, well, I am working on um, Hard Boiled, which is not the John Woo film, but the um, Frank Miller 
uh, Jeff Darrow um, comic book. Um, so that that will be, I would have thought, our. Um, but I, I thought I don't know what, what you guys thought about Logan, but I, I when I I really enjoyed it. I was but a big it, fan. But but it's probably the most violent thing I've ever seen in my life. No, no, it's incredible. It is yeah. inc incredibly. It's like it's, but it's yeah. a proper film as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It stands alone and it makes sense and it has very little to do with the rest of the X Men movies. It's you know it's yeah. a, no, I thought it was really good. Yeah, yeah, no, it was good. And it would yeah, it was just like you know what is if that's the fifteen. Yeah, what's the eighteen? Although interestingly enough, the BBFC have had a lot of it's been split both ways on the one hand people have been saying for heaven's sake you know that is a very very top end 15 we've had lots of mail here from people saying you know is it really figure yeah it's a top end 15 and then on the other hand people complaining well it's you know i my eight-year-old wants to go and see it yeah, you, know, yeah. you haven't said them no it's it's what would have been in our day been an x rating yeah yeah and then some yeah yeah it's a very it's very stabby isn't it very very yeah very tough very physical yeah and um you know and that's one of their guidelines is no repetitive um, uh, stabbing, and then that film is all that. So I, I was confused. It's that. not lingering, and I know this because I've had this. It's yeah, not yeah. lingering. It's specifically not lingering, but it's startling. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and and well, the so injury is hurt. Yeah. The, the, the stabbing isn't lingering. Yeah, you don't you don't linger on injury. That is the the, the BB the definition between going from fifteen to eighteen. Sorry, I could get very nerdy about this. Yes, I know all about it too. I've had, I've had many conversations with them. You know. Well, Ben, you do because you're a filmmaker. And that's, of course, you have. <laughs> and in thirty seconds, what was the main issue that you that they had with this, if they had any, indeed, with Free Fire. Um, what were the conversations you had? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, they, they, the one note I got was um, no pooling blood. So I was like, fine, that's all right. And in the in the environment of that warehouse, the, the, it soaked everything up anyway, <laughs> anyway, so it didn't matter. So that was actually quite realistic. That, that doesn't like sound like a big editorial compromise that you had to make. No, I was I was really I'd vi envisioned this as a big pooling blood movie, and then I had to <laughs> I had to move back from that position. So that whole shining lift sequence had to go. That was all that cut, wasn't, cut, okay. cut, cut. Uh, ben, we appreciate you coming in. Thank you very much indeed. We've got loads more emails from which we'll get to after the news. But thank you very much indeed for coming in. We appreciate you. Thank you.